let's give a LifeWork leadership welcome to Marnu Poso. Yes, I almost thought there was another hand clap coming there from the stairs, okay. I just want to state that uh, Ron asked me to speak, and I actually said I would prefer not to speak, because anybody that knows anything about public speaking, you check who the other guys are going to be speaking, and if you know you're going to be the weakest speaker of the evening, you try and get out of it. But I was forced into it, and uh, also, I, I've never really shared a, a stage with a global I am a cheetah, so um, just that they know. What's the highlight is that we do have the curry cup in Bloemfontein still, okay? although I haven't been to Bloemfontein in 25 years, but okay. Um, you can start that first slide for me, thanks. So I just want to share a little bit, I think some of the things that we've learned from LifeWork over the last couple of years, and something we're really trying to install in LifeWork, is to try and help leaders, individuals, companies, organizations, how do you establish a healthy organization how do you bring God into a company? How do you bring Christianity into it? How do you change that internal culture, the, the beliefs in a social system like that? And I think that's something we've been trying to achieve as much as we can. Like uh, Ron was saying, I think last year, in the last six months, we had about 1,000 visitors to our offices that come to do and attend a culture tour. So we, we actually present culture tours to companies to come here, come through the offices, etc. and we talk to him a little bit about that. So I'm going to give you just a couple of thoughts tonight on that. So you're welcome to use it or lose it, which I think is a rugby term, but okay. Let's go for it. What do we have up there? Um, let me use maybe this example quickly. This is Microsoft's three CEOs. So they've had these three CEOs for the last many years. Put up the next slide for me, and I want to show you something. That is Microsoft share price. Do you want to take a guess where the, three trans or the two transitions was between CEOs? So when um, their founders started here, they took the share price of Microsoft all the way to $58 a, a share. He gave over to a guy by the name of Steve Ballmer, the guy standing on the right-hand side, and he, I think, pretty much messed it up from $58 to $38 over 14 years. I'm quite amazed he lasted that long with an all-time low of $18. He then gave it back, just take me to the previous slide, and then he gave it back to this guy, Satya Nadella, the guy in the center, and he took the share price from $38 to $114 within four years. That's quite something. The leadership styles between these guys, all three of them, differ immensely. If you want to see some real Americanism on steroids, please go and Google Steve Ballmer going crazy, and you, I think you'll see how not to do it, okay? It's ridiculous how this guy can scream and shout. It's really something ridiculous. It's really funny, actually. Satya, on the other hand, a humble leader, gentle leader, soft-spoken leader, but he took that company by changing the culture. You can go two slides forward, please. And um, when he took over, he said, fixing the culture was my number one priority, fixing the culture. He never speaks badly about anybody, everything I've watched from him not as his predecessor who would badmouth everything and everyone and everything he can. Very humble guy. Changed the organizational culture totally, and we see the immense impact it had. I'm not going to go into the detail of everything he's done. Go one slide further. But I think this is a powerful statement coming from their company. It said, we went from a culture of know-it-alls to a culture of learn-it-alls. And then at the end, they were saying, well, everything we do now is rooted in a growth mindset. The one thing that you cannot build an organization with, you cannot build an organization with arrogant people. Uh, Sean Fitzpatrick was telling on a video how they choose players to play for the All Blacks. And there's a small segment where he says a very powerful thing. He says, you know, when they're not nice, we simply don't select them. Just like that. If they're not nice people, and it's like, what? And the guy says, what do you mean if they're not nice? He says, well, we've got a lot of good players. They're all good. But if they're not nice, what meaning if they're not teachable, if they, don't, if they can't learn, we can do nothing with them. He says, no, there's nothing as difficult as an arrogant player. You can't mold him. You can't shape him. And I think very much of that is an organizational culture, very simple, to keep a humble attitude, to stay pliable, to stay changeable, just stay open for that change. So you've all heard this statement. It was made famous many years ago. It says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. 
But we've added to that, so if anybody quotes the rest, it comes from us from now on. We, it was created this week. Okay, so it's fresh, fresh, fresh. Okay, just uh, press it again, see if it works. But maybe structure will eat culture for lunch is what we said. I want to give you a biblical example. I think life, the life in an organization should always produce structure. When a tree has life in it, it pushes that life into the structure it has of the branches, and it pushes the branches into the direction. So structure should always be formed by the life that's originated within the system. But if structure is created to try and contain and keep the life, structure will eat culture. So yes, culture will eat strategy, but I think structure has the same capacity to eat culture. So you have to align those three things. Strategy, culture, and... Um, What's the third thing we said? Structure. That's right. If you can align those three things, you can build a really healthy culture. Great. Let's go to the next one. So I think some of the, one of the very big things, and it's a big basic belief for us at King Price, is to say people over profit. We need to invest in people. We need to make sure if your investment in your people is healthy, you get healthy individuals. Healthy individuals build healthy teams. Healthy teams build healthy departments. Healthy departments build healthy companies. Same in any team dynamic. If you have those 15 healthy guys, healthy people, make better decisions, build stronger relationships, are just more stable in everything they do. Great. Let's go for another one. I think one of the things we decided at King Price from the very beginning is that we would like to bring forth a change in the world. And it's going to take a world-class company to, to change the world. So what we try and embed in our people from day one in our induction process, we always ask them, it says, listen, average is never going to change the world. If you do anything on average, it will never change the world. You have to be above average. The team playing average doesn't win the Curry Cup, doesn't win the World Cup. It's those teams that plays above average and eventually plays the best. So you have to install a mentality or a thinking or mindset that says, guys, whatever we're going to do, we're going to do it world class. If we're going to bring forth change in the world, let's do it in a world class way. It doesn't mean in a perfect way. I'm not somebody for perfectionism. Neither is Gideon. Our favorite word, I think we, Adele, did we invent it? Flawsome. I hope that we didn't. Okay, we didn't. But that's our favorite word. Flawsome. We always say, we think we're awesome. We have a bit of a self-esteem, but we're full of flaws. So, flawsome is our favorite word. So, it's not perfectionism. It's just striving to what we think can be excellent. Um, go from there on. So I think something we've seen in cultures, we often say that toxic people can kill culture very slowly, but toxic leaders can kill culture overnight. I think and that's why I think life work has such a great potential investing into people's lives. Because I know many of the people sitting here are leaders in your own right and leaders in your organizations, in teams, in companies, owning your own company maybe. You have the ability, and we've seen it over the last couple of years working with many companies as well in culture, the massive impact. Leadership is a, just an accelerator when it comes to culture. When leadership takes that responsibility and if this, God has called you to be a leader, a CEO, or just a leader of a team on any level, you take that responsibility, you have the ability to influence culture quite quickly. Great, let's go to another one. We always say that culture is revealed. The way we see culture is revealed in the, the way we think, we speak, and behave which is those three elements, the head, the heart, and the hands. The way we think, we speak, and behave. That's the way I can see what culture is. If I had to come to your house and listen to the way you speak and look at stuff you eat and look at stuff you do, I'll be able to make a couple of assumptions about your culture. Very similar in any organization, any team dynamic. Uh, we need to look at how people do things. How do we think about clients? How do we think about people? How do we think about the staff internally? So one of our most important values here is customer is king. Trying to treat everybody as royalty. Hopefully, mostly we get that right. We also don't get it right. We, um, like I said, we do have mistakes. We have things that doesn't always go according to plan. But you need, we need to continuously drive that. And the only place you can change behavior and change culture is when you change thinking. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. The Bible also says, be transformed by the renewing or the changing of your mind. So when we work on culture, especially internally, we try and work on mindsets first, on thinking first, because the only way you can bring forth sustainable change, continuous change. 
Okay, skip this one, skip the next one, skip another one. Let me see. Okay, that's our culture design. Don't worry too much about that. It's just the way we've put together our story. Um, it's a bit much. It's, we call it our culture blueprint. But don't worry, I'm not going to talk about that tonight. Uh, skip that for me. Sorry. Okay, let me quickly. So we often refer to, and, and, and uh, Ron also said, want to show a little bit of stats and figures what happens. So we refer to unadaptive cultures versus adaptive cultures. So the, uh, being adaptive, at least have the mindset to change and continuously change. This was a study done by Cotter and Escott. I'm not going to go into the detail, but let me just show you. This was the companies they took. They took 207 companies and they said these were the unadaptive cultures. They had a revenue increase over an 11-year period of 166%. Their stock price grew at 74%, which is not great over 11 years. 36% workforce growth, but their net income only grew with 1%. Click it once. Let's look at the, another one, adaptive culture. Just open up that whole slide for me. The adaptive cultures, their revenue grew at 682%, stock price with 900%, workforce with 280%. But the most important, look at this difference on the bottom line. And those refer to adaptive cultures. Now, there's a lot of elements. Come for a culture tour, we'll tell you more, okay? I can't tell you in 15 minutes. But I just want to show you, this was a proper study done on culture in organizations. That's the effect it has. Just go for me another one. Uh, skip that one. I think I've said enough about this. Jim Stengel took what he called the Stengel Top 50 Companies, which is this red line. He said, let's see how did the companies that focus their internal culture on a sense of purpose and a sense of uh, companies who center their business on a culture of improving people's lives. How would they compare to the rest of the S&P 500 companies? And the difference between those two lines in about 11-year period, was almost 400% in shareholder return. It just gives you, when you give people a sense of purpose, so we always share our purpose at King Price with all our new people when they come in day one, two, and three. We, we, we spend quite a, we, we talk about our purpose, we tell our story from Gideon as CEO. I spend a day with them, a morning with them on our purpose, and then we do a personal life purpose of every individual. We ask them to write, write their personal life purpose, and we're trying to align your life purpose with the company purpose. And we do believe that in that alignment of your own purpose, understanding why you come to the office every day, there's just greater results that is produced. Let's go for another one. This is a couple of different studies, which is what's the effect of happiness at work. Now, this is an interesting study. It always fascinates me when I look at this because I think we've also had quite a lot of churches coming to our culture tour. And we then take them through like a two-hour chat afterwards. And I often ask them this chat, and I just I have this question, and I just watch their faces. I don't expect them to answer, it's scared, because I get scared when pastors answer you honestly. Okay, so um, um, I said, how much of you still have fun being a pastor? How, much, how, much, how many of you still have fun doing what you're doing? How many of you still enjoy, any, any one of us, do you still enjoy doing what you're doing? Because if you're happy, you're engaged. If you're not happy doing what you're doing, you disengage. So what's the effect of happiness at work? Harvard Business Review said people who are happy at work are so engaged, up to 300% more innovative, up to 44% higher retention, 37% increase in sales, 30% increase in productivity, 125% less chance of burnout when you just enjoy doing what you're doing. And then miraculously, they're quite healthy. 66% fewer sick leave. In our industry, especially on Fridays and Mondays, and I know in the Cape as well, they actually, I think that's also, Fridays and Mondays is always the, the problem, right? Uh, for, for whatever mysterious reasons. So if you look at those results, that is just the results what companies can organize, of can, can produce when people are happy doing what they're doing. That's why we try, we always ask our people on the very first day they start, we ask them this question. Would you prefer to work in a nice place with bad people? or in a bad place with nice people? What would you choose? What do you think? What would you choose? Bad place with nice people, or nice place with bad people? No, you always would choose where there's nicer people. Nice people can make any place nice. Even if the place is bad, the people will change it. Quickly paint the walls and put some music on, do something, it will be better. But then we say, why do you have to choose between the two? It's not either or, it's both and more. So why, let's create a great place, but let's build really good people, great people, because that's where your real investment really lies. Let's go for another one. Uh, sorry, this is, um, the quality on the screen is not too great, I see. The blue line is the 100, 
uh, best workplaces in the U.S., places where people would choose to work. They love to work. The rest is the S&P 500 companies. If you look at that, places where people choose to work, want to work, always outperforms people where, places where people have to work. So we also put quite an emphasis day one and say, make a decision about your attitude. Is it want to or have to? And in South Africa, with the economic situation we're in, I always tell the people, if you just look at the stats of how many people cannot find work, which is somewhere between 9 and 11 million people that cannot find work today. They would want to work, but they cannot find a job. If you just realize the mere fact that you have a job, you are in a certain sense ahead of almost 10 million people in our country. That alone should just shake your whole attitude into line. That alone should say, you know, I'm just thankful I've got a job. So we put quite an emphasis on, on attitude, and attitude is to want to versus have to. Let me put in this um, scripture here. I think this is a scripture that spoke to me a while ago, about a year or two ago, Matthew 25, 23, where uh, we have that whole story, and then it, it's it ended, you know, of the, of the, of the, um, the servants, and then it comes and says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter the joy of your Lord, the parable of the, of the um, talents. And I was one night, I think it was, working with guys sitting here. And, um, and one night I was just praying and, and I was for the specific solution in that situation. The Lord just gave me the scripture and, and that, just keep that up for a while if you don't mind. And I just felt, I think this is a great biblical text for as a foundation to build culture. Anything you do, ask yourself, what is the standard of doing? Will those be the first words you hear also when you leave this earth? Well done. Well, speaking of the standard of doing. Done. What is your actions? Good. Refers to the character, the way in which it was done. And there's always inclusivity. Everything we do in culture and organizations and teamwork, it's always inclusive. It's never me alone, you alone. Faithfulness builds trust. Servant is our style that we work in. Stewardship gives us ownership. And once again, he said, enter the joy of the Lord. That's your maximum level of engagement when you know, you know God and you just experience the joy of the Lord, which is our strength as well. Do I have slides left? Okay, just click it. One, two, three. Uh, so if you want to hear more, uh, you're welcome to come for a tour. We're also presenting Culture Days. I think the next one is going to be in March. We present a, a full day on culture. So you're welcome to, to, to contact us. Yeah, 17th of March, just send us an email to culture at King Price. And we will gladly welcome you. Um, the tours, uh, we try and book certain specific days. Last year we did Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And we try and sometimes group people together to just because it's, there was just too many. And um, so you're, you're welcome to contact us. Just send us a mail and we'll gladly. We just feel this is part of our purpose statement at King Price. We would share the information we've got there. On a culture tour, we share everything that we can in that two or three hours we share with people freely. The Culture Day has a cost to it, but we've made it as cheap as possible. It's really a very cheap fee, I think. And um, once again, to share that, we believe we can, if we can make a better workplace in South Africa and many places, that'll be great. We just to, that's sort of the part of that we would love to bring forth change in our country to build higher engagement of staff. Great. Thank you, Ron.